Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament passage of 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 12. The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 12. The Apostle Paul is now closing down this second letter to the church of Corinth. And with this church uh, letter, he has been showing lots of love and adoration for this church that he wants the best for the church. And he is explaining how much he's trying to care for the church. And we could see this part in the end of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 as Paul is conveying his love and explaining a little bit more of his relationship and what he is trying to do. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and notice with me in verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says this, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will be... I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. The more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But it be so, I did not burden you. Therefore, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make mention of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, thank ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear, lest when I come, I should not find you as I would, that I would that I should find unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbiting, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and last, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, that I should bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a powerful phrase the Apostle Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 12, where he says in verse number 15, that be spent for you. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Corinth and explaining his relationship and saying basically he will be glad he will be spent for you. And with this, we're going to see this very special relationship and learn some principles from this relationship be spent for you. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, I'm asking you to give us great wisdom and that you would give us great discernment, that we'd be able to pull things out of this passage that we ought to, that we could apply to our own lives, and that we could apply these principles. Lord, In a special way, I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to work, to grab a hold of hearts, to give understanding, to give illumination, that they can see these principles, that they could work these principles in their life, and that things would be better for their life and their family because of these things. Lord, give me strength and power beyond myself for you to get your own work accomplished. I just surrender myself now. Fill me with your spirit and you get your own work accomplished in Jesus name. Amen. The Apostle Paul now is dealing with the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth, if you remember, had lots and lots of things wrong with it. We saw those listed in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul spent a lot of time correcting behavior and dealing with issues and working with them. And now that he has written the letter of 1 Corinthians, some people have 
have turned, but there's still a contention of people who are against his reign, who says we could do whatever we want. We don't want Paul to tell us what to do. And so Paul now is changing the tone and tenor and explaining why they should listen to him, not only because he's an apostle, but because of the special relationship he has with him. Notice if you don't mind as we examine this text, the first thing we see is that as parents for the children, as parents for the children. Now, in these verses, Paul re- uh, reveals his parental heart for the Corinthians. Remember in this relationship, as he had started the church and God used him to pastor the church, that there's a relationship of a parent and children. And in here, he is having to deal with unruly, misbehaved children, and he is giving principles about how to be a parent, how to take care of things, which is something that we're missing in this world quite often. That today people don't know how to be the parents and they're missing out on things and they're hurting their children because they won't be the parents. As a police chaplain, it's interesting that the police officers have the same uh, message that the pastor does. Be the parent. 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 I cannot tell you how many houses we go to because some parent doesn't want to be the parent. They won't control their kids. They won't discipline the kids. And the police officers are like, why are you calling us for this? Be the parent. There should be no reason why we're involved. Be the parent. It's even gotten to the place where if they have me as a chaplain, they'll talk, they'll have some people there and they said, listen, we've got a chaplain here. He's going to explain to you your role of being a parent. Listen to him. So now I'm involved with the call, but be the parent. It is amazing people don't want to be the parent. You know what they want to be? They want to be the friend. But those rules don't work. You must be the parent. Paul is going to explain that in here that you have to be the parent. Notice with me in verse 14. Behold, the third time I will come to you and I will not be burdensome to you for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He says, when I'm coming to you, I'm not here to be served or whatever else. I'm coming to be the parent. Coming to be the parent. If you want to put it in a way that we'd understand, daddy's coming home. You wait till your father gets home. Paul says, listen, I'm going to come and I'm going to be the parent. I'm not here to give you a good time. Now, I'd like to have a good relationship with you, but I'm coming to be the parent because that's the most important thing is to correct this behavior. This behavior cannot go on. I'm coming to be the parent and I'm writing you to let you know I'm coming home. Daddy's coming home and we're going to fix this. We're going to fix this behavior. You cannot continue alloy with it. In fact, verse 15, notice this. He says, and I will very gladly spend And be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be love. Now when you have unruly children, this statement becomes true. When you have unruly children, that the parent has to be the parent. And when they're the parent, the children are not fond of the parents. Why? No child wants to be corrected. No child wants to be fixed. And so what happens, the parent now has a choice. Do I be quote unquote loved with a weak anemic love because I'm their friend? Or do I show them real love by disciplining them? You understand you cannot have both. If a parent doesn't discipline their kids, their kids will not respect them. And without that respect, you'll never have that type of friendship you're actually looking for. You must be the parent. It is the best thing that you could do for a child is to be the parent. I know you're tired of me saying that, but Paul was tired of saying that too. Listen, why are you misbehaving? Why are you acting like this? In fact, notice what Paul said at the beginning of verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. You understand being a parent is hard work. It takes a lot out of you. That's why people don't want to be the parent because it's work. You spend yourself. It costs you something to be the parent. It costs energy. 
It costs time. It costs discipline. It costs the time to discipline the kids to make sure that they're and the follow up to make sure the kids are up there. Let me give an example. Here's a normal thing. Go clean your room. And the child doesn't do it, but the parent never inspects it. Remember, people don't do what you expect. They do what you inspect. And so if you don't inspect it, they don't do it. You've just said useless words. Why didn't they do it? It takes work to go follow up on what you said. It takes work. I don't want to take the time to go and look in their room. But that's your job. You're the parent. But it costs too much. Yes, it does. You will spend yourself and be spent in order to be the parent. This is part of it. To be the parent, it is hard work. Which is, again, why people don't do it today. They don't like that W word. It's work. To discipline. It takes work to train the child. This is what you do. This is how you behave. This is how you act. This is what you say. This is how you treat others. The idea is that it does take work. And you spend yourself. You take a lot of time and a lot of energy to pour into a child for them to behave the way that they should. For them to act the way that they should. So they could turn out. You are spent. Parents are tired. For those of you who raise your children, remember, you're tired. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of pouring yourself out. But that is what is necessary. You pour yourself out for the love of that child. For, because you love that child. And understanding that this is a type of love where you don't get back. You love that child and they don't seem to like you back. Yeah, welcome to parenthood. You pour yourself into that child and they want to, fine, I just don't like you anymore. Okay, well, guess what? There's a correction for that, but you may have that there. We're still correcting. We're still going to do it. The idea is that they're not going to appreciate the work and the labor you did the entire time you're raising the kid. Hopefully when they become an adult and they get discernment and they go, oh, I appreciate what my parents do. There should be a type of thing where later on the kids call you up and say, you know what? I appreciate all that you poured into me. In fact, I probably needed more spankings. Realizing how much they poured into you. But that is part of being a parent. And you cannot skip this. You must pour. You must take the time. There's an idea that every a uh, boy needs to grow up to be a man. That does not come automatic. You want, to want, you want to wonder why our society has so many man childs? Because they were never taught how to be a man. They were never taught to say, this is what we do. This is how we do things. Pick yourself up. Don't cry over a video game. Don't cry because your sister took your Barbie doll away. <laughs> the idea, how to carry yourself. Young ladies don't become Young ladies, young women, naturally, it takes an investment. Taking a young girl, this is how you sit down properly. This is how you sit down as a lady. This is how you think. Young ladies don't do this. Taking the time and putting the effort in. All right, teach them at a young hang. You got to take care of your hair because otherwise it becomes tangled and messy and whatever else, that you need to carry yourself. You need to be taught how to carry yourself. You understand posture is a big deal? I know that we're like, we're really going away from the mess. I know, I'm trying to help now. But do you understand posture is a big deal? Teaching kids eye contact? Look at me when I talk to you. You know, that's a lot of work when they're out of practice. Look at me. Look at me. Speak up. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You understand, well, that's old fashioned. No, 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 no. That's raising kids right. Just because every other goofball is not raising our kids right doesn't mean that we don't. We need to raise our kids correctly. And there's Bible principles. But you say, but it's work. Yes, that's the whole point of what we're saying. You're spending yourself. You are taking your time. And it is worth the time, but it is not appreciative work. I don't know any parent in the middle of raising kids felt appreciated. 
You may get flowers every once in a while and they may have a school project where they have to do something nice and you get a card from there. It may come time where Mother's Day comes and it's the dad saying, all right, kids, do something for your mom. I don't care, do something. But it doesn't come natural. You will not be appreciated as a parent. So brand new parents or parents to be one day, you will not be appreciated. Just giving that thing. And you're not supposed to look for it. You are to be willing to be spent. You are to be willing to pour yourself out. Be willing to not get something back from them right away. It is an investment. And you get your reward later on when they're a good person, a good citizen and following after God. Because bypassing it and having a child that's not serving God out of church has no desire. That hurts. It is worth the investment. This verse illustrates Paul's sacrificial love that he was willing to pour out his life to the Corinthians. Now think about the Corinthian church. At the Corinthian church, this whole book, 2 Corinthians is written because there is people that said, hashtag not my apostle. He's not the boss of me. I'm not going to listen to him. Now think of Paul as a parent. How much time did he invest in this church? How much prayer did he invest in this church? He is not being appreciated, but he's saying, I'm not doing this for your appreciation. I'm doing this because it's right. And I'm the parent and I'm pouring myself out, even though they are being horrible to Paul. They are rebelling against Paul. And Paul says, I love you, but you love me less. That's fine. I'm willing to be spent for you, even though it is not reciprocated. That is part of being the parent and this relationship. Notice as he goes on, he says, not only as a parent to a child, but the second thing we see here is caught you in guile. Caught you in guile. Verse 16, but be it so, I did not burning you, uh, burden you, nevertheless being crafty, talking about the church of Corinth being crafty, I caught you with guile. The idea of guile is a part of the lying family. It's where you tell a story in such a way that makes you look better or someone else look worse. And what they started to do after all the things that they said, hashtag not my apostle, he doesn't keep his word. Remember they had the thing early on where he mentioned that just because circumstances didn't allow me to come, you started to say, I'm a liar and I don't keep my word. They started to say, well, Paul just had these visions and we just can't trust what he says. And oh, he's too proud. Now, those guile, those liars have actually said, you know, the reason why you sent Titus is that you were trying to get money from us. And that's why you sent Titus. That wasn't true at all. They're twisting things and making it up there and trying to let Paul look bad because of their guile. By the way, children do this. You know, from their perspective, they love to talk about how horrible their parents are. If you were honest, you probably did that too. You probably exaggerated something that happened or miss some details when explaining to someone to make you look like the good child and your parents were not that good at all. They twisted things. By the way, that's why we're very careful when we listen to teenagers complain about their parents. We always side with authority as much as possible because people twist it. Even in their little minds, they think that they're, be, they're the victim. You know, we live in a victim society, right? Children do that. My parent wasn't good to me. They didn't buy me a Nintendo when I wanted one. My, my parents didn't love me because they didn't buy me a truck when I turned sweet 16. You know, we hear people complain. We laughed a couple years ago. We heard some lady said, you know, the whole reason why I rebel and I'm into drugs and alcohol is because my parents were too good to me. See what happens is they don't care. They'll find something they can, they can do. That's what kids do. Why? They're children. It's not the children's responsibility to behave as much as it is the responsibility of the parents to make them behave. They're children. 
They're going to lie. They're going to exaggerate. Even in their little minds, they can lie to themselves. Mom's making me my, clean my room. It's not fair. It doesn't have to be fair. I'm the parent. My mom gave me a bedtime. My friends can be out till 10 and she's making me go to bed at seven and I'm only six. Doesn't matter. We had a kid who would have a hard time in school as a freshman. Because, not my kid, but when I was teaching high school because his parents let him play video games until four o'clock in the morning. Is he ready to go to school the next day? But the parents wouldn't do anything about it. He would just play video games all night. And there's nothing I could do as a teacher. That's a parent responsibility. And as long as the parents let him, he's going to do that. The idea is that you have to be the parent. My parents are, and you know how they did that? How he did that? Mom, you're not good to me. I think I should stay up as long as I want. I should decide. I know what I'm doing. No, that's the whole point. I'm the parent, you're not. You do what I say because I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you instruction. I'm trying to put discipline in your life and you don't have discernment. Mom's not good because she made me do homework. It's not fair. I don't think I should do homework. That's a real complaint I've heard from people. Mom's not good. My teacher hates me. I just know they hate me. That's what kids do. They full of guile. And Paul's dealing with a church that's purposely lying to him. But yet he's saying, I'm still willing to be spent for you. I'm still willing to pour myself out knowing that you're against me and knowing that you're lying to me. I'm still willing to be the parent. By the way, that's part of a tactic that teenagers like to do is they like to lie until their parents finally say, I give up. I don't want to do this anymore. And the parents said, that was the whole plan. I'm free but they don't realize their freedom hurts them. The parent has to be willing to lock down and say, I don't care whether you like it or not. You are going to obey because I'm trying to help you. It's a lot of work. Yes, it's a lot of work. By the way, just a friendly tip. If you take care of the kid early and often, you'll enjoy the teenage years. I cannot tell you, I've been pastoring for a whole bunch of years now. I've been assisting pastoring with that. I've been in the ministry for 25 years. I have been here long enough that I've watched children grow up. I've watched parents ignore my advice, ignore biblical advice. And then they're in the office later on crying. And I'm saying, if you would have just listened to me years ago, we wouldn't be here. If you just would have listened, I've been trying to help, trying to work. But the fight is real. You understand if you take care of this stuff early, you'll enjoy them later. If you could forgive the personal illustration, I have three teenagers. One's about ready not to be a teenager next week. But they're, they're grown up. You know, I've enjoyed their teenage years. Why? We took care of things early and often at the beginning. And so the teenage years, it's wonderful. They're great helps. I don't want my kids to leave because they're such great helps. Again, I'm not trying to brag. I'm trying to say there's a principle. You take care of it early and often and do the work early. It's a blessing later. Please take my word on this. But it takes work even if they don't and they turn rebellious teenagers. You can't give up and say do whatever you want. Even if they lie, even if they have guile, even if they're trying to convince everyone how bad you are, be the parent. Paul is brokenhearted of this. Again, what specifically are they accusing Paul of? Verse number 17, did I make gain of you by any of them that I sent unto you? I desired Titus and with him I sent a brother. Remember that when Titus went, they also had another brother for accountability two people that were keeping the finances. Paul has always gone out of his way to make sure that he could not be accused of anything on finances. And yet what they're doing, I desired Titus and with him a brother. Did Titus make gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? He said, Titus, when he came and he came with a brother, he had accountability. Did Titus try to get money from you? Did he try to say, hey, I need more money? No. And I didn't do that. But what they're doing is said, Titus came and demanded money. And now Paul's getting rich because he sent his little lap dog to take care of this. 
That wasn't the purpose at all. Titus loved this church. In fact, he came back and said, Paul, can I go back? Can I help take care of them? I love those. Those are some good folks there. Can you imagine that there's some people that are lying against Titus and Titus is the one that's defending them? And they're accusing Paul. They're twisting the truth. They're making things. And this hurts. Paul's getting beat up by them. But he still says, I'm willing to be spent for you. No matter the lying, no matter the rebellion, no matter you trying to get away from the authority, I'm going to be spent for you as a parent to a child. I love you. Notice in verse 19, again, think that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God and Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. Here, Paul is saying the reason why we do these things is because we love you. We're trying to be a help to you. Paul wasn't trying to defend his reputation for the idea of winning an argument. His sole concern is for the spiritual well-being of the church. Every action, every decision that was made was to help that church. He says, I'm willing to be spent for you. I'm willing to be beat up for you. I'm willing to use my energy for you. Because I love you and I want the best for you. The things that I do is to help you. When we, we as a parent correct our child, it's not because we're hating them. It's because we want the best for them. When we make them sit down and behave, it's because we want the best. When we make them take out the trash as part of chores, it's because we want the best for them. When we make them mow the lawn, it's because we want the best for them. These things that we do, we're willing to be spent no matter what their response, we cannot stop that being spent for them, even though they may have issues. Which again, notice this last thing, found you as ye would not. Found you as ye would not. Now again, keeping this idea of a relationship between a parent and a child. That Corinth, if you could put in your mind, is a teenager. And so as a parent, what do you do with a teenager? You be the parent. Why? Why? Well, it's going to answer why. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 20. He says, For I fear, lest when I come, I should not find you as I would, and that I would find you unto you as you would not. So it carries the idea that when Paul says, When I come back, what I fear is that you're not going to be what you should be. You're going to be what you shouldn't be. Why is it that parents are willing to be spent for their kids? Why is it they're willing to pair, uh, uh, pour themselves out for the future investment? So that way when they grow up, they're the people that they're supposed to be. Rather than people that they're not supposed to be. For the church of Corinth, he says, why am I spending all this time correcting you? Because I'm afraid when I show up, daddy's coming home, I'm going to find you in this condition. Notice with me in verse 20. For I fear, lest when I come, that I should not find you as I would... And that I should find unto you as ye would not. Lest there be debates. The idea of debates is they want to argue everything. That I don't want to come back and find you that you have to argue about every little thing. That that's not the idea of submission. That's not the idea of worship. And you're not going to make it far in life if you feel like you have to argue every single person. For those of us who have learned adulting, it doesn't work that way. You can't argue with your boss. You can't argue with clients. You can't argue with customers. You can't argue with your neighbors. Not in a debate over every little thing. You're just going to have a miserable life if you feel like you have to argue and debate every little issue. He says, lest I come you back and you be in debates. Envyings. The idea of envyings is looking at other people. I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Why do they have that? It's not fair. I deserve that. You know, there are many... 20, 30 year olds who are in this thing. It's not fair. Why do they have that? And I don't have that. I should have a brand new car. I should have a new house. I'm entitled. You might want to put that next to that. We live in an entitled age. Do you know what we're entitled to? Hell. We're not entitled for people to take care of us. We're not entitled for the government to take care of us. We're not entitled for the church to take care of us. We're not entitled that our family take care of us. We're not entitled that the neighbors take care of us. But we're so entitled, we are spoiled brats. We expect everything to be given to us without working for it. 
this entitled. It's not fair. Why do they get into I deserve a new TV. I deserve a new video game. I deserve this car. I deserve this thing. Entitled. Why? Spoiled children. Children who haven't been taught to work. Children who haven't taught the respect of things. They're entitled. By the way, where did this entitled mentality come from? It came from after World War II when the the uh, great generation came home, they saw the horrors of war, they saw the things, and they said this, I want my children to have it better than what I had. And they worked hard for that. The next generation said, well, I want my children to have it better than what I had. And they worked towards it. And the next generation said, well, I want my children to have it better than what I have. And the next generation, I want my children to have it. And guess what? We've done that. Kids have it better off than before, but with it, they weren't taught that you have to work for it. They have developed an entitled thing. My parents have always given me everything that I want, so therefore, everyone else should give me what I want. My parents never spanked and corrected me, so I don't think it's right that anyone else should correct my behavior. You're like, people do that? Yeah, it's called, I work with the police. And that's exactly what people think. It's always someone else's fault because they're entitled. A young lady underage going into a grocery store, going to the alcohol um, section with a cart, loaded it full of alcohol and walked outside of the doors without paying an underage girl. Not the first time she did it and not the first time she got caught because she's underage. It defers to the parent and the parent says, okay. Is that young lady going to taught how to be a responsible adult? No, she has not been taught. There's any consequences to her action and it's going to ruin her later on. It's not helping her. The parent needed to be the parent. You're like, you're being mean on parents. No, I'm trying to help parents right now. The home is falling apart. And the result of it is not sweet children who love me because I decided not to correct them. You're going to raise monsters. Yeah, you're being really mean. No, we're working with monsters out there. Entitled people who feel like I don't have to work anything that society owes me. I can do whatever I want. There's no consequences. And these are going to be spoiled children. Notice again what he says. For I fear lest when I come, I should not find you as I would, but that I should find you as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths. You know, we live in an angry generation. Kids are angry with their parents. Teenagers are angry with their parents. 20-year-olds are angry with their parents. Angry with society. Angry. We live in people, they're angry. Upset. Why are they angry? Because they haven't been taught how to deal with confrontation. They haven't been taught that, you know what? It's all right when people correct you, it's good for you. And part of that entitled thing. Now they're angry because they didn't get their way. Notice it goes on. It says debates, envies, wrath, strifes. Strife carries the idea of fights. We live in a place, in a society where people want to fight each other all the time. You understand we have failed to teach people how to solve problem with words. How to listen to someone. How to not have to go to war with each other. To allow someone to have a differing opinion. We can all agree that we live in a society today where you're not allowed to have a differing opinion. They will beat you up and yell at you and call you names because you have a differing appearance. We don't know how to communicate. We don't know how to solve problems. We don't know how to take the wrong. We don't know how to make peace. We live in a place of strife where people just want to fight all the time. And if you have something against, by the way, it's not just a liberal crowd. Church people have the same thing that if it's not done the way that I think, so it's not done the way that our church says, so it must be wrong. Let's beat them up. We are all just in a place where we want to fight all the time. Lest there be debates, envying, strifes, backbitings. Backbiting is another word for gossip. 
You know what? We live in a gossip age. How do we know? Facebook. We're in a political season. You know what happens? Some ad or some post comes up against the candidate you hate and you don't do a background check. You don't see if that's true or not. You just share it anyways. Do you know what President Biden did? Do you know what President Trump did? Do you know what Vice President uh, Kamala had done? And what happens? You don't fact check it. That's called gossip. And we participate in it. We like to gossip. You know what so-and-so did? Backbitings. That should not be, that should be something taken care of at the home. We are not talking bad about someone else. But the neighbor, it doesn't matter. We're not talking about the neighbor. That's something to be taught at home and teach children. We're not going to gossip. We're not going to talk bad about people. We're not going to do that. And because it's not, gossip is rampant and people love gossip. All you have to do to ruin someone is to start a rumor. Nuh-uh, that's not true. Uh Uh-uh, this is what it is. That's what half the political ads right now is gossip and hearsay, not substantiated. By the way, both sides. They just gossip, just, oh, I heard a juicy rumor. Let's go ahead and spread it. Notice as it goes on. Backbitings, whisperings, once again, carrying the idea of whisperings, but this is kind of behind the back. Swellings. This swellings is pretty important. It's puffed up. Pride. I'm better than them. We're not better than them. That's what we've been teaching today. But you know what? We live in a society. I'm better than so-and-so. I'm better than this people. I'm better than this. What we're teaching is here's a list of spoiled children who grew up still spoiled. One more thing on this list there. It says tumults. The idea of tumults once again carries the idea of this fighting, this uh, disorder, this uh, um, disruption. By the way, do we live in a society where people like to disrupt things? Absolutely. These are all things that should have been taken care of in the home. And Paul is saying as a parent to their children. I'm trying to take care of this so you don't act this way, but I'm afraid that you're spoiled brats. I'm going to come back and this is what I'm going to find. And by the way, daddy's coming home. Notice the next verse where we see what Paul's planning on doing. Verse 21. And last, when I come again, my God will humble me among you. By the way, when your parent, kid, children don't act the way that you should, there is a humbleness by parents. Oops. Oops. This isn't how I was supposed to raise my kids. This is not how they should have been turned out. There's a humbleness and a brokenheartedness. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already. This idea of bewailed is mourn. I'm going to come there and see the things that are mourned and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they've committed. He says, the thing I'm afraid of is I'm going to come back. And I'm going to be humbled when I come back. And not only are you doing these things, but they're not even ashamed of them. I can live however I want. You don't tell me what to do. They're not even ashamed. But you know that you shouldn't be sleeping around. It's my life. I can do whatever I want. Sound familiar? I could do whatever I want. And they're not even broken hearted. This is not how you were supposed to act. This is not how to behave. This is not how to become a functioning member of society or in the church of Corinth. This is not how a New Testament church is supposed to behave. He says, I'm doing all of this. I'm willing to be spent for you, even though it's hard, even though you don't appreciate it, even though there's a lot of things to be fixed. I have to pour myself out to you because I want you to be the people that God wants you to be. I have to put forth the effort, even though it may not seem I'm getting out of it what I'm supposed to get out of it, even though I'm not being appreciated the way that I should. I'm doing this. He says, I'm afraid I'm going to come back and there's a lack of repentance, a lack of brokenheartedness. The idea that I am spent for you is the idea of a parent pouring themselves out to a child. It is hard work and it's going to be resented. It's hard work and no one's going to appreciate it till later on if they get enough discernment later said, I appreciate what my parents did for me. Because no child wants to be corrected. No child thinks that they're wrong. That's the parent's job to point that out. No child obeys automatically. That's the 
par- uh, job of the parent. And it is a lot of hard work. But when it is done right, the Bible says, I have no greater joy than to watch my children walk in truth. That's the goal is for the children to be living for the Lord. That's the goal for the each New Testament church to be living for the Lord. But there's a lot of hard work. Parenting is not easy, but it is well worth it. The tired nights, the exhaustion from that constant correcting. Well, I'm tired of t- telling my kid to stop. Well, keep doing it anyways. Keep doing it. Don't give up. Put in the work because it is worth it. We have a life that is in the balance and that your investment is going to help the child live for the Lord or live for themselves. With it, I must be willing to be spent for you. Let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And again, we know that this turned to more of a message on the home. And we know that we have a lot of folks here that have already raised their kids and they're already moved on to a different stage of life. However, it's still important to know these principles because we have influence over others. There's some people in here that plan on having kids in the future. There are some that have kids now currently and that we need to hear messages like this and hear the Paul's love for the church of Corinth and how he was treating that church for the purpose of seeing that church grow up and be mature instead of being rebellious and self-centered. Lord, help us to have the courage and bravery to be dependent upon your spirit, knowing we can't do it ourselves. We have to have you in order to raise the next generation for you the way that it ought, that we must be the parent. We know that this principle goes beyond just parenting, that as Paul's using it to the church, we have to be the parent in our Sunday school class. We have to be the parent in the nursery. We have to be parent in the areas of responsibility that we have, that we have to be the parent knowing that we're influencing. We have to be willing to be spent. Lord, I'm praying that every Sunday school teacher would be willing to be spent for their class. That every discipler will be spent for their disciple. That they'd be willing to put in the investment, put in the work to see that child Live for the Lord that the way that they ought to. Lord, help change homes and change this church because of this, this principle here to be willing to be spent for someone else. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.